1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Okay, then it goes down and talks about the people that have witnessed Jesus Christ's resurrection. But you see there, Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. If he had just died and stayed dead, he's not helping you at all. Okay? He died. He was buried. He rose again. Why? Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He paid the ultimate sacrifice. God himself shall provide a lamb for the sacrifice. Back in the book of Genesis with Abraham and Isaac. God himself paid for your sins with his own shed blood. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. You can read about that. God hath purchased us with his own blood. You are washed in the blood if you are saved right now. Your sins are completely erased. You come to God, you say, God, I'm a sinner. I realize I can't save myself. All right? Understanding that you are a sinner. Understanding that you're no good, that you can't be any good with your own self-righteousness. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. The blood washes your sins away. It's that simple. You say, well, then good, I can just go on living like I want to. No, because when you get saved, now you become God's property. Your life is not your own. God's going to tell you what to do. Not before your salvation. Not before. Well, i got to get cleaned up and then I can get saved. No, 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 no. You come to God as a sinner. You come to God broken and He fixes you. All right? But don't come and tell me that these people that say, I'm a Christian and I live just like the world and I hate the Bible and I hate other Christians and whatever else, but I'm a Christian because I prayed a prayer. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay? Again, other study. But you see there, salvation defined for us. Now, getting back to what the uh, miraculous end would be. What well, if you're post-tribber or pre-wrath, post-wrath, whatever, <laughs> you know, these weird, stupid positions that these heretics have come up with. What is the miraculous event? There isn't any. You go right into the time of Jacob's trouble. You go right into Daniel's 70th week. Daniel's 70th week is for the church. Even though I've clearly demonstrated that that's a lie. I mean, read Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. You know, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. That's not the body of Christ. Okay? It's not the church. Uh, unless you're, you know, the Vatican, you might think that the holy city is Vatican City, which it isn't. It's Jerusalem. And, of course, the Vatican is trying to take over Jerusalem. But uh, interesting. But what is the miraculous event? 1 Corinthians, the same chapter we're in, chapter 15, verse 51. Okay? We're going to see what the miraculous event is that ends the church age. Verse, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. Paul's not talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is mentioned in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 20, chapter 21. He's not talking about that. He's talking about a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this immortal this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not the defeat, because we go into the time of Jacob's trouble, the Daniel 70th week. We have victory through Jesus Christ. Verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, you say, are you going to change? Are you ever going to change your stands on the pre trib rapture? No. No. I'm right. You're wrong. All right. If you're a post tribber, you're wrong. You're not right with God. You might be saved, but you're awfully stupid. Okay. I'm not going to apologize to you. You are wrong. You say, I don't like it. I don't like your tone of voice. Then get some other video out there to watch. All right. 
I am right, you are wrong. The Bible teaches a miraculous event stops the church age. It's that way with every dispensation. If you don't believe that, you are disobedient. You are not studying to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You're wrong. Okay? And it's not just I that am, that am right and I'm better than everybody else. That isn't it either. Don't try to put that on me. Okay? It's those that stand for a rapture before the time of Jacob's trouble, a catching away of the body of Christ. The mystery in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that doesn't appear at all in Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Those passages are for the Jews, the nation of Israel. All right? Absolutely heretical. But I am going to be steadfast and I am going to be unmovable on the issue of the rapture. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, which you'll do if you believe that Jesus Christ could come back at any time, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Again, yes it is if you're post-trib. I could work hard for years and years and years and years and years, and all of a sudden the Antichrist shows up, signs the covenant, uh-oh, mark of the beast time, and I go, I have to provide for my family. And I go out and I take the mark of the beast. I go to hell. According to scripture, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Yes, it is if you go into the time of Jacob's trouble and you take the mark. Your salvation, everything was in vain. You've lost it all. Because you just took the mark of the beast. You see the heretical position these post-trib people get themselves into? So, again, we see salvation right now is faith alone. Solo fide, you know, the big stand of a lot of the reformers. Faith alone. Not the Catholic thing of, well, faith that Jesus died on the cross, but then works that we have to continually eat him and drink his blood, prohibited in Scripture. Talked about that earlier. We have to continually do that and do penance and, and confession, auricular confession, and, and, you know, make pilgrimages to the Vatican and all this other stuff and, you know, allow our children to be raped and molested by the Catholic priest, you know, or the nun, whichever one they want to do. You know, that's not there. No, Catholicism is illegitimate. Catholicism is not true Bible-believing Christianity. All right? Our salvation is by faith alone right now in what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. It's not of works. Okay? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You know, it's over and over and over again. It ends, the church age ends with the body of Christ. When the body of Christ is complete, we leave. Bye-bye. That's the way it's going to be. A miraculous event always ends a dispensation and starts another one. When the rapture happens, it's going to be the single most chaotic event ever in history. And I do believe that the little children under the age of accountability and children mature at different ages, so I can't give you an actual age, you know, 10 years old or less or something. Children mature at different ages. The point is when they can understand that they've sinned against God, they've reached the age of accountability. Okay? But children that are too young for that, I believe that they're going to be leaving at the catching away of the bride of Christ. Now, the trauma that that's going to cause is going to be the perfect ground for the Antichrist to show up and set up the covenant, and you go right into it. I mean, if the body of Christ is going to be there and the Antichrist shows up and signs a covenant, every member of the body of Christ is going to be out there, you know, preaching, it. he's the Antichrist, he's the Antichrist, he's the Antichrist, you know. But the body of Christ leaves, and now you have God sending down the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, the 144,000 sealed Jews, and they start preaching the word. Why? The dispensation changed. Let's talk about that next dispensation. Daniel's 70th week, also known as the time of Jacob's trouble. Salvation is faith and works. We're going to see that. And the miraculous end is the second coming of Jesus Christ with his saints at the end. All right. Daniel chapter 9. Back to the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. You know, I, I'm, I'm really losing a lot of grace for these 
post-trib thieves, these post-trib liars and deceivers. Because, I mean, I've been putting this stuff out, and there's a lot of other brethren out there, too. I mean, Doug Stauffer, he's put out a bunch of stuff defending the pre-tribulation rapture, if you want to call it that, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. Uh, Sam Gipp has, I mean, th there's a lot of good stuff out there. You have no excuse for believing that post-trib stuff. It's just replacement theology, Catholicism. It's disgusting. And the Catholics, by the way, in their catechism teach that the, the church has to go through a final time of purification, the final trial of pur purification, you know, this great tribulation time period. <laughs> so you're just believing Catholic doctrine. Don't even bother when the comments. The, the rapture, preacher rapture was formed by two Jesuits, Ribeiro and some other, you know. <laughs> Give me a break. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27 says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, the Jews, in other words, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy, Jesus Christ, when he comes back. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Unto the Messiah the prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks, three score is what? Sixty. The score is twenty, so you have three twenties is sixty. Threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. The Messiah came, he got cut off, not for himself, but to save worthless sinners like us. Uh, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. Read about in Revelation chapter 12, I believe it is. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And again big study there, a whole other study, and we can't get into it all here because this is just supposed to be a simple thing. All right, but what is the salvation in this time period? How's it defined? Turn to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. It says here, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So you have an angel coming and preaching the gospel too, along with Moses and Elijah, 144,000. Interesting. What is the gospel? Let's read. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. What's the fearing God? Don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast. Give glory to Him. Faith in Christ. We'll see that. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor, not, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Sorry, no eternal security in that time. Verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Works, faith. You're seeing it. Grace through faith. It's the cross alone. You know, you're crazy. Absolutely, totally crazy. In that time period, it's faith and works. You just read it, plain as day. Now, what is the miraculous event that ends the time of Jacob's trouble? Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 21. It says here, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. 
His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Read about that in Revelation chapter 13. You know that the Antichrist causes all these people, both free and bond, small and great, to receive a mark. Here's where the Lord destroys them. Verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and, the, and their armies gathered together together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Sounds like a miraculous event to me. Slightly, <laughs> you know. Wow. Of course, we have a very miraculous event that ends the time of Jacob's trouble. And this same event is also written about over in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 is a synopsis of the whole time of Jacob's trouble, the seven years. Revelation chapter 19 gets into a little bit more detail about what Jesus does when he comes back down. Don't let anybody tell you Revelation 19, or Revelation chapter 6 and 19 are two different events. They're not. They're the same. And the post-tribbers have to separate them and make them two different events. You know, to get Christians into the time of Jacob's trouble, to push the Jews out of that time and say, well, God's not really dealing with Israel because we are the true Israel now. And yeah, we've heard it all before, you bunch of Catholics. Now, what's the final dispensation? The Millennial Kingdom. Salvation is works alone. The miraculous end is the great white throne judgment. Okay? We're going to see about this. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Went right past it there. I was turning this way. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And again, these post-tribbers, I show the Rasmussen book, you know, they get all mixed up and they have to put stuff into the millennial kingdom and Jesus is only reigning for 997 years now instead of a thousand. Anybody starts telling you that stuff, just say, you're a liar, get away from me. You know, I'm going to hold fast and, and steadfast and be unmovable. Thank you very much. They say you're stubborn. Thank you. I appreciate the compliment. Yes, I am stubborn. I'm not going to move. You ain't going to move me. All right. Now turn back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. You say, what's this works only thing? You know, I don't agree with that. It can't be works only. Well, let's see about that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, what do we just read in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4? They live and reign with Christ on the earth? Jesus Christ physically on the earth? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I have faith in Jesus Christ right now. You know why I have faith? Because I can't see Him. Are the people in the Millennial Kingdom going to be able to see Jesus? Yes. Then how can they have faith? Faith is the evidence of things not seen. We just read it. How can you have faith when Jesus Christ is physically on the earth? See, again, the problem if you're non-dispensational. Turn back, back to Matthew chapter 25. This is the judgment of the nations. And we're going to see here that towards the end, and you know, I'm going to just be real frank with you, a lot of that stuff you get into the time of Jacob's trouble, 
and a lot of the stuff that's going on at the end there and everything, it's just like, you know what? It's not my dispensation. There's a lot of questions and a lot of things. This world's going to be totally different when the body of Christ comes back, okay? It's going to look completely different, and it's going to be a completely different situation. So I, don't, I am not going to be so arrogant and prideful as to say that I got the whole thing figured out and I can expound all of the book of Revelation and all of what goes on in the future. There's a lot of stuff that's a mystery to me, okay? I don't understand it. I have faith that the Lord's going to work that stuff out, okay? But let's look here. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 46. We'll read these verses here. And tell me if you can find faith. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, that's the second coming, Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 6, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And you read earlier back in the book of Matthew where it talks about the separating of the wheat and the tares, you know, and the kingdom and things like this. This is what it's talking about. The wheat being the sheep, the tares being the goats. That's what it's talking about. But let me ask you a question. Uh, where does it say anything about faith? Jesus is physically there on the earth. He's sitting on the, in, on the throne in Jerusalem, city of the great king. It says back in Matthew chapter 5. He's sitting there and he's judging all nations. They're all gathered together to come to the judgment, the ju judgment of the nations before the millennial kingdom starts. And, you know, God's got all that time period worked out. I don't know how he does this whole thing. But I just trust him. I say, oh, you know, Lord's greater than me. He's much greater than my intellect. I'm not going to try to get up on his level and show people how smart I am or something. I just say, oh, Lord works that stuff out. I don't know. I know what I'm supposed to do for now. I know what I'm supposed to, what my orders are, my marching orders are for here in the church age. You know, I'm not going to worry about this time here. But I can see there's no faith involved. Let's continue. Verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, and everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, does he say anything about faith? Let's look for it. For I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Faith is not mentioned once. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. No faith. Why? At the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, there's not going to be any discussion anymore of, I wonder if God exists. There won't be any more atheists at the end of that thing. There's plenty of atheists right now and their little smart little comments and whatever. It's going to be over soon for them. Okay? If any of them actually survive to this time period here, they better get very zealous working for the Lord and doing what's mentioned here in Matthew chapter 25. They better get very zealous because if they don't do good works towards the end, when God has definitely been revealed, Again, Revelation chapter 10, you see the mystery of God is finished. People can now see God. They know God is real. They see the proof. So you get into the millennial kingdom with good works. And that continues into the millennial kingdom. No faith. You say, but how does it end? Well... As I've been demonstrating, turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 20. As I've been demonstrating, it ends with a 
miraculous event. What is the miraculous event? Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, Jesus is still there, ruling and reigning after a thousand years in Jerusalem, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Global warming. Not really, but you know, I, I just say that. Verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. So much for the little Jehovah's Witness thing, of the hell is the grave and it's annihilation and stuff. No, the beast and the false prophet are still there after a thousand years. Interesting. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was, was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, that ends it. It goes into eternity. Again, a miraculous event ends the seventh dispensation. All right, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Well, that's the same gospel, the same situation we have today. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. There are different dispensations. There are different things, different ways that God deals with different people. Okay, God is not going to wipe away all your tears right now. He can save you, but you're going to have plenty of tears as a Christian. You're still going to have times of persecution and trials and things like that that you're going to go through. It's going to be there. All right. There are different dispensations. So important to get that. Now, in closing, here's a little surprise for you, a little extra, a little bonus here. You ready? God showed this seven dispensational plan, seven part dispensational plan when he created the world. What? Check this out. What happened on the first day of creation? God created light and separated night and day. Okay? Adam was the created son of God, according to Luke chapter 3, verse 38. He was sinless until he died for his wife. Read about that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. Adam wasn't deceived. He knew what Eve did. And he realized Eve's going to die. I don't want her to die, and then I'll be alone. So he died with her. Hmm. Just like Jesus Christ did on the cross for us, his bride. Interesting. Satan caused Eve to sin, and the, the change was like night and day. They had the light there before. They were talking with God. They were walking with God. They didn't even know what sin was. They had true light from God. And God eventually had to separate night and day in the first dispensation, also on the first day. What about day two? God divided the waters from the waters by a firmament. 
You read about that in Genesis chapter 1. He divides the waters. Uh, what happened in that first time period before the law was given? The uh, flood in the days of Noah? Interesting. What about day three? Dry land appears and vegetation is formed. You say, how does that line up with Moses and the law? That doesn't make any sense. Think about this. God's laws are the solid foundation on which the saved stand. You can't stand on water unless you're miraculous like the Lord Jesus, you know. But the, the point is, we need solid ground, something solid to stand upon. What did God write the Ten Commandments on? Tables of stone. Solid ground. Created on the third day. And uh, you say, but how, what's this have to do with vegetation? Well, uh, what happens if you follow God's laws? You will bear fruit. Interesting. What about the fourth day? God makes the sun, hmm, moon and stars. The sun. Uh, who was it that showed up there? John the Baptist. Behold the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make path, make straight the path of you know the way of the Lord and things like this. Who was it that showed up? Jesus Christ, the uh, Son of God. 4,000 years after the creation? Coincidence. Just all coincidental, I'm sure. And of course, the moon represents those that reflect the light of the sun. And the moon is often spoken of in the feminine in your Bible, King James Bible. Kind of like the church. We don't have our own light. We reflect the light that Adam lost, but that we get back from Jesus Christ, His righteousness. Adam was sinlessly perfect until he fell for his bride. Okay? Jesus Christ was sinlessly perfect until he became sin on the cross, who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. His righteousness, his light, is imputed to us. So now as the moon, we reflect the light of the sun on day four in the fourth dispensation. What about the fifth day. God makes birds and fish. What did Jesus Christ say to his disciples? Come after me and I'll make you fishers of men? Hmm. And there are clean and unclean birds and fish. Well, what is the body of Christ? Jews and Gentiles. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Day six. What happens on day six? God makes animals and man. You say, well, how does that line up with the time of Jacob's trouble? That doesn't make any sense. Well, uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 18 states that the number 666 is the number of man. The number uh, six? What day was it? The uh, sixth day? Hmm. You say, well, we got it right so far, but uh, what about that seventh day? Yeah, how about that? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8 identifies one day as a thousand years with the Lord. What did the Lord do on the seventh day of creation? He rested from all His work. What's the millennial kingdom? The kingdom of rest. Hmm. You say, uh... I'm not going to be dispensational. I'll never be dispensational. Then your pride is going to blind you and you will never be used by God. God can't use you if you're non-dispensational. Why? You make a mess of the Bible. All post-trib heretics that are coming out of the woodwork right now are all trying to tell you to not rightly divide the word of truth. They're trying to say there will be no miraculous end to the church age. The church age morphs into Daniel's 70th week. The church steals the promises of Israel. You know what they are? Besides being quite ignorant, they're false prophets. They're lying to you. Do not be deceived. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much, Lord, for your precision system that you have laid out in your word 
and it's right there. I thank you, Lord, for this study that you showed to me. And uh, just amazing seeing this whole thing, how it works out. And um, Lord, I just really do pray that you please would help all those out there. Uh, if they're not convinced that they would take some time to study uh, this issue further and uh, that they would just really uh, get away from these lies of the post-tribbers. Um, it's just so disgusting to see these people trying to steal promises that you made to the Jews and trying to put themselves into Daniel's 70th week and, and uh, when Christians are not appointed under, under the wrath and the judgment of, of you um, in terms of what you're going to be doing to the earth. And I just really do pray, Lord, that you would just, just help those that are, that are saved out there, the Bible-believing brethren that I have, my brothers and sisters in Christ, um, not to listen to me, not to put me on a pedestal or anything else, Lord, but that they would stick by your word and that, uh, that they would continue in the things that they have learned and, and been assured of and not let anybody shake their faith. And I just uh, ask all these things, and, I, and I, I'll say this yet, and that is I just pray, Lord, that you would keep all of us busy about your work and not get sidetracked and, and start to fear man and fear the world. And I just uh, pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Um, stay steadfast, brethren. Uh, again, I've talked about this in other studies. Um, you know, unless you are really called into the ministry, uh, you know, and, and to debunk people and stuff like that, like I do, um, stay away from these false prophets. I mean, when you when you see people and they're like, actually, I don't believe the the rapture, you know, the preacher rapture is a lie, or you know, when when you start saying, you know, when they would say that it's a lie, I'll say it that way, you know, just go, yeah, okay, sorry, conversation's over, don't want to talk to you, you know, study the issue so you can you know go back and forth with them a little bit, but if you know if they're prideful, they're not going to bend, don't waste your time on them, don't waste your time on them, okay? All they're trying to do is just destroy your faith and the blessed hope. They're trying to take a crown away from you, as I've said in many other studies. Don't fall for it, all right? And, you know, one other thing I want to say, too, in terms of dispensationalism is concerned, there is a movement called hyper-dispensationalism. And, again, I get accused of that. I oh, you're hyper-dispensational. Anybody that calls me hyper-dispensational uh, is just proving that they're complete ignorance. I mean, I have a book uh, right here, okay? I have the materials, all right? I've done the study. Cornelius Stamm, Things That Differ, uh, is what it's called, The Fundamentals of Dispensationalism. This guy is a hyper-dispensationalist. What they'll do is they'll agree with what I said on most of the dispensations, but in the church age, they have two separate bodies of Christ. Peter, James, John, you know, the guys that were there before Paul, they have, you know, from Paul until, or excuse me, from the crucifixion, maybe Acts chapter 2, up until Paul, and then from Paul to the rapture. Uh, absolute nonsense. And, you know, let me just give you a real quick verse on that, um, just in case you ever run into one of these heretics. Romans chapter 16, uh, verse 7 says, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. So, they try to say that there's two bodies of Christ, the, you know, and, and whatever else. There's, they're not the same. Um, Paul lists two people there that are his kinsmen. They're Jews. And they were in Christ before Paul. And, of course, you can, you can debate these hyper-dispensationalists. They're quite heretical. But, you know, don't fall for hyper-dispensationalism. You start hearing somebody saying the church of the one body or Paul. You know, they're putting way too much emphasis on Paul. And they're, they're saying, you know... Other things bad. Let me show you one other verse here, real quickly. Again, just to warn you about this hyper dispensational thing. First Timothy chapter six. Um, First Timothy chapter six, verse three. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Gospels, uh, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strife of strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil, evil surmisings perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. So uh, you have to be careful. You have to rightly divide the word of truth in the Gospels. That's true. But to say, like a hyper-dispensationalist, they say the Gospels are, there's nothing in them, okay? And the early part of the book of Acts up to like chapter 9, some even go further than that, like 18 or something. I mean, crazy. And they'll say, that's not for us. Only the Pauline epistles, you know. 
uh, be careful with that stuff. Be real careful. Um, you know, it's just, it's just craziness. Some of the stuff that these people come up with, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So you can take doctrine from any part of the Bible, but it always has to line up with what is written to Christians in the Pauline epistles. You know, it has to be there. Right? And again, like I said, you can get real deep into all this stuff, but just watch out when you get people that start saying, that only Paul and you can't go anywhere else. Mm, dangerous, very dangerous. And I'm not a hybrid dispensationalist, so don't even go there. So uh, that's going to be it for this study. Um, please keep us in your prayers. Uh, we have a lot of projects we're doing, um, construction projects around here, around the ministry headquarters. Um, that's why I'm kind of in and out doing videos and things. A uh, lot of work to do here. Um, before winter comes, before because winter comes like a vengeance here in northern Maine, <laughs> you know, I mean it's 30, 40 degrees below zero. You you don't exactly just say ah I'll wait till winter time to do outside work and construction things here, you know. Uh, no, that doesn't work. Uh, you aren't gonna be doing much work outside when it gets that cold. So uh, we're very busy, and um, so just please keep us in your prayers. Uh, but I wanted to put this study together to explain the basics of dispensationalism. Like I said, if you want more, Doug Stauffer's book, I recommend that. Uh, he's going to be coming out with a second edition soon. Um, you know, if you want a lot more information, that's where you go. Okay, I, I can't be the end-all expert on all subjects. I'm not. It's as simple as that. And I'm getting a lot of questions. People asking me these really detailed questions. And I'm just like, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that people respect me. And all, but I, you know, I'm just kind of a dumb hillbilly, you know, that the Lord put me into the ministry and just, you know, kind of gave me the Bible and shoved me out and said, okay, now, you know, fly, you know, just kind of like I'm a little bird and he just kind of chucks me out of the nest and goes, okay, see how you can do it. I'm going, huh, you know, and I'm trying my best. I try to answer people's questions, you know, I don't always get around to it. I don't, I can't answer everybody, you know, email, letters, whatever. It just gets to be too much. I mean, we have a regular life outside of the ministry. You know, we do witness, you know, locally here, you know, and things. And, uh, you know, so it's just like, I'm trying. Please keep us in your prayers. <sighs> I think that's going to be it. Now, I did a, I've been doing videos now for about uh, just about four hours. So I'm going to take a break. Uh, much study is a weariness to the flesh. <laughs> Uh, I had a real night, rough night last night of sleep too, so, you know, just a, a bunch of stuff coming up and things and just, you know, so that's going to be it. I'm going to quit ranting now, so that's it. Thank you for watching.